Thank you, Paige, for your kind remarks. And I would like to express thanks to the Centre of Bioethics and Human Dignity for the funding that enabled me to uh, do my research on this topic. What I'd like to do tonight is to just give a bit of an overview about um, where we got, how we got to where we are now in terms of the public debate of the origin of human life. And uh, if you're interested in, in the themes that I discuss, uh, there is more detail in the book. But um, I would just like to bring to your attention um, some of the ideas that got us to where we are now. I don't think anyone knows how many unborn humans lose their lives through human agency each year. Internationally, through just abortion and IVF, it's in the tens of millions. Numbers far too big for us to comprehend. And our rapidly developing ability to manipulate unborn humans now means that we can create human embryos outside the womb for fertility treatments or just for research with no intention of ever giving them a chance to develop. We have contraceptives which inter interrupt embryonic development and elective abortion is widespread. In the literature, arguments are being made for the need to test every unborn child for disability before they are allowed to be born with the understanding that only normal babies should come to birth. Now the issue of when human life begins has long been of interest to biologists, but I think what brought the arguments most recently to mind was the um, embryonic stem cell debate. Uh, embryonic stem cells, human embryonic stem cells, were discovered in uh, 1998. However, there have been long-standing discussions about um, the importance of unborn humans uh, around the topics of abortion, contraception and IVF that make sure that the beginning of life issues are always somewhere in the news. Um, but we need to go back many years to understand how we came to the current state of understanding around the origin of human life. And as is so often the case uh, in bioethics, we need to familiarise ourselves with the science before we can come to a proper ethical view. And I think it's the complexity of a lot of these issues that makes it so hard for Christians to understand how they should think about them. And I think the tension between knowing what is possible um, uh, we, in the context of good and normal human desires to have children, to have healthy children, creates a tension where a lot of Christians decide it's just too hard to work out right from wrong. So they park God at the, at the door of the clinic and they let their doctor tell them what is the right thing to do. But if your doctor's not a Christian, he may not be thinking in a biblical uh, worldview in terms of right and wrong. And so you may not get advice that helps you live a life which is in accordance to what is taught in the Bible. So in order to understand these issues, first of all tonight we'll need to look at uh, some biology and uh, so we're all on the same page. We're going to have a biology lesson to remember embryology of the human. And then we'll briefly consider uh, the ethics that's prompted some of the current debates and we'll finally consider um, some of the ways the embryo is, is manipulated uh, with the current technology to see um, why there are some problems. So this is a cross-section of the female reproductive system and this is how the majority of us are conceived. Human conception begins with fertilization of an egg by a sperm and that creates a single cell called a zygote. The female, female human gamete is actually called an oocyte. The, the eggs is a more culinary term, but I'm using it tonight for familiarity. Now from this point, you have a single cell where the sperm and egg join that's called a zygote. And the development from that single cell is now a continuum through pregnancy and childhood to adulthood. And all the DNA required for full maturity of uh, that human being is present in the single cell. And in embryology terms, we have in that single cell a member of the species Homo sapiens. 
Cell organization begins immediately, even before the genome is activated. Uh, so we're not dealing with what is often called just a clump of cells. Beware of the use of language in this topic because it's often used to mislead the public. The first cell division occurs within 24 hours of conception and cellular division continues while the embryo travels down the fallopian tube towards the uterus. By this time it will be comprised of four different types of cell and this diagram shows us um, the inner cell mass uh, in the red and the supporting structures in the blue and green tissues. Day five to six we have a blastocyst which is like a hollow ball with a clump of cells in the middle and that's where the embryonic stem cells come from. Um, in day uh, seven to eight, ten, on the, at the end of the first week, implantation begins where the embryo attaches to the wall of the mother's uterus and the mother's blood supply starts to nourish it. Sadly, this doesn't always occur successfully, in which case you'll have an early miscarriage. In week three, the future spinal cord begins to develop and heart tubes begin to fuse. Blood cell production begins in the embryo. In week four, the embryo measures three millimetres in length. The heart begins to beat at a regular rhythm. We have development of brain, thyroid, eyes and ears beginning. And we need to remember that each of us once looked like this. In week five, we have continued development of eyes, mouth, nose, sinuses, lungs, arms, hands and legs begin to grow and the embryo's own blood supply starts to circulate. In week six, the embryo measures eight millimetres in length. That we have beginning of formation of the feet, ears, nipples and bones. We have continued development of the face and the brain. Arms and legs have lengthened with foot and hand areas distinguishable. And these have digits, though they may still be webbed. At seven weeks, the embryo measures 1.3 centimetres in length. The trunk lengthens and straightens. The upper limbs are longer and bent at the elbow and the kidneys start to develop. In week eight, the embryo measures three centimetres in length. The facial features continue to develop with eyelids and ears taking shape. The head is more rounded and the beginnings of all essential internal and external structures are present. So you can see that even while we are still at the embryo stage, an enormous amount of development has already taken place. Now the terminology changes at eight weeks and instead of calling it an embryo, we now call it a fetus. At three months, the fetus reaches a length of just over eight centimetres. The face and body are now formed and all organs are beginning to function. They just need to mature for the remainder of the pregnancy. At four months, tooth enamel is developing and the pregnant woman can detect fetal movement. The fetus is producing its own hormones and by now the baby can feel pain. Some people think it's at um, uh, as early as 17 weeks, but it's certainly developed by 24 weeks. At five months, the baby may have hiccups from swallowing too much amniotic fluid and the two sides of the brain begin to differentiate asymmetrically. At six months, the hair starts to grow, gas exchange is possible in the lungs and the sense of smell is functioning. The eyes begin to detect light and they may uh, produce tears. Then things start to get a bit tight and we have a newborn at term. Now, I don't think many people would disagree that a newborn baby is a human being who deserves protection. So my question is, if this is a human being, when did it stop being a human being so that it is okay to discard it if it's no longer wanted? I would suggest um, that we need to think about it from the time of the human zygote's formation. And this is the view of internationally preeminent embryologist Rowan O'Rahili. He has no doubt in biological terms that we're now dealing with a human being. As you can see on the slide, although life is a continuous process, fertilization is a critical landmark because under ordinary circumstances, 
a new genetically distinct organism is formed when the chromosomes of the male and female pronuclei blend in the egg. This remains true even though the embryonic genome is not actually activated until two to eight cells are present at about two to three days. During the embryonic period proper, milestones include fertilization, activation of the embryonic genome, segregation of embryonic from extra embryonic cells, implantation and the appearance of the primitive streak and bilateral symmetry. Despite the various embryological milestones, however, development is a continuous rather than a saltatory or stepwise process and hence the selection of prenatal events would seem to be largely arbitrary. So what he's saying is that everything that was needed to grow was present from that first cell and it directed its own development since then. It would be arbitrary to say that life began at any time after fertilization. So biologically, when the sperm and egg joined together, human life began. Thankfully, this is no longer contested in informed debate. With regard to abortion and embryo destruction, it is no longer an argument of whether we're dealing with developing humans. It's now a matter of when or whether they deserve protection. But as you know, a lot of public debate is not well informed, so sadly we need to continue to proclaim the humanity of the unborn human. So how did the bioethical debate develop? How has the public addressed the question of how we treat unborn humans in the 21st century? Well, at the centre of the public debate is a d disagreement over whether developing humans deserve to be protected, whether they have a right to life. The disagreement can most easily be understood if we look at the different ways of defining the embryo. Now, as we've seen, As we've seen, there is no doubt biologically that in, we are dealing with a human being from the time of fertilization. The embryo from the time it is created is a unique, unified, dynamic, self-directed whole. This is not even vaguely controversial in scientific terms. So if there is no doubt that the human embryo is in fact just that, human, how is its wanton destruction justified? Well, um, this is generally discussed in terms of the philosophical definition. Protagonists of destructive embryo research have suggested that protection is only due to human persons and that personhood is not achieved on merely biological grounds. The concept of human personhood probably had its root in ancient Greek thought, but for much of its history, personhood was understood to mean an individual being of rational nature. As explained by Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, one who possesses a human nature possesses a rational nature, even if they are unable to freely express it at the time. Therefore, it was considered that all human beings were human persons. This is certainly how it has been viewed for the majority of human history. Until recently, it would have been inconceivable that you could have a human being who wasn't a human person. The definition of, of personhood underwent a change last century when in 1954, the Reverend Joseph Fletcher published an account of human personhood which claimed that the human person must not merely possess a rational nature, but be able to exercise it at the time. Fletcher's uh, definition was driven less by scientific discovery than uh, in reaction to the political debate of the time around abortion. He wanted to justify legal abortion, and obviously, if the embryo wasn't a fully human person, it would be much easier to justify um, abortion itself. 
Fletcher argues that what sets us apart from animals is our possession of reason. He claimed that this is what grounds human dignity and is signified by the term person. He claimed uh, that if the human embryo is not a human person, then it doesn't deserve protection. And for Fletcher, the possession of human nature with the latent or the inactive ability to, um, to reason was insufficient. And thus, not only embryos, but also fetuses and newly born infants uh, were uh, not persons on, on those grounds. And he recognised that the killing of infants would have to be acceptable under his terms. Those in a prolonged coma or uh, with dementia would likewise be excluded because they would not have the active ability to reason. So you can see how dangerous that type of thinking is. Well, in response to this argument, I would suggest that this is not an acceptable way to decide which human beings deserve protection. Traditionally, those who are unable to speak for themselves and are therefore much more vulnerable in society are the ones who are being seen as being in need of more protection rather than less. It suggests we should stick to the traditional idea that if you are a human being, you are a human person, uh, even if you are unable to express your, your human reason at that particular time. Now, once the idea of human personhood was up for grabs, there were lots of different ideas expressed as to when human personhood began. And you can see a list of them on the slide. Generally, these theories will require that the unborn child have particular features or abilities between, uh, before they're being considered worthy of protection. And that we have a bit of light humour to help us on the way through. Personally, I agree with O'Rahili. Yes, each one of these points is a significant um, stage of development, but once we go past fertilisation, that's all it is. Just one stage and then the next stage and then the next stage. I think we also have to notice that some of these characteristics aren't even intrinsic qualities of the embryo. For example, viability to some extent de determines, is determined by what technology is available uh, where the child is born at, in the intensive care unit. Birth depends on many factors outside of the embryo itself. But the ideas that were most influential in international debates on human embryo research were those expressed by the Warnock Committee that reported to the UK government in 1984. They were charged uh, with um, responsibility to decide whether and at what time human embryos could be destroyed in research. And while acknowledging that embryonic humans had some sort of a special status, they decided to avoid answering the question of when human life began and instead discussed how the embryo should be treated. Despite criticisms of this pro approach, I mean, how can you dis decide uh, how the embryo sh should be treated if you don't know what it is? Uh, the committee's recommendation that destructive hem human embryo research was permissible uh, and justifiable up to 14 days has influenced policy makers around the world ever since. The introduction of IVF in the United States was justified uh, after putting aside the question of the moral status of the embryo. And interestingly, at the time this decision was made, the longest anyone had grown an embryo outside of a human body was 14 days. How convenient. The Warnock Committee conferred emerging personhood on the embryo. That, that is, they said it increases with time and um, they justified 14 days on the grounds that that was when you saw the primitive streak or the beginning of the nervous system organisation in the embryo. Uh, and also that was the time when twinning was no longer possible. Of course, this science is way out of date now. Um, as we've already seen, the human embryo is organised right from the very first cell. Uh, but nonetheless, 
um, the Warnock report remains influential. Its assumptions were seen all the way through the UK's um, um, review of their embryo research uh, legislation in 2005. And it's an ethical principle that's been confirmed by lots of government committees now, including US and Australian ethical committees. But the interesting thing to notice about the 14-day rule, uh, if you look in the philosophical literature, is that nobody's happy with it. According to them, either the, the pre-14-day embryo is being unjustifiably exploited because the human embryo deserves protection, or else uh, research on embryo is being unjustifiably limited because it doesn't. Um, how do we decide which is correct? Well, certainly not by asking the researchers. So let's stop for a minute to see what we have so far as the basis for our decisions about the treatment of unborn humans. Firstly, we have out-of-date science. Very little, if any, public discussion has taken place uh, that discusses um, how we now know the human being is so intricately developed from the time of fertilisation. And we have philosophical arguments which have an agenda of creating an artificial standard so that researchers and, and other people in the community um, can do whatever they wanted to do and that they are able to, to create the situation where some embryos and fetuses don't deserve protection. But the philosophical argument ultimately underlying this thinking is the philosophical um, or ethical theory of consequentialism. Now, this is a, um, uh, the argument that we decide right and wrong by looking only at the consequences of our action. So you can say in any ethical decision we start with motives which help us form intentions, then we act and our action has consequences. These people say, well, motives, intentions, actions aren't what's important. It's the consequences that we use to work out right from wrong. Uh, this theory is often uh, coined as the end justifies the means. Our community has decided that. While the destruction of developing humans may be seen to be regrettable, the potential benefits uh, such as medical cures through embryonic stem cell research, a child of one's own through IVF, uh, perhaps freedom from unwanted pregnancy and abortion, all these things um, make it uh, justifiable to destroy unborn humans. And some proponents would go so far to say it's unethical not to go ahead with these technologies and that those who raise ethical questions lack compassion for those who are suffering. But saying that we might as well use human embryos for research or, or these other technologies depends on the idea that the human embryo is not a human person deserving of protection. It is, of course, an extension of that idea that the species Homo sapiens deserves no special treatment, that we are not exceptional because we are just an accident of an unguided, unguided evolutionary process, that we've just come here from chance, there's nothing special about us, there's no reason why human embryos should be treated any more carefully than any other organism. But before I go on, I would also just like to say that some of those people who support destruction of embryos in particular aren't necessary monsters who don't care about unborn babies. Most of the ones I've met are driven by the desire to help their patients um, with uh, various types uh, of treatments. And they honestly don't believe that we have a human embryo, at, a human being at the early stage of embryonic development. And the reason they think that is because in 1972, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists deliberately changed the definition of conception so that instead of a pregnancy commencing at fertilization, they said it commenced at implantation 10 days after the embryo started to develop. And the reason they did that was to widen 
the contraceptive market. The full story is in the book. They didn't have the authority to do that because they weren't embryologists, the experts in the field. Um, but if you look in a medical textbook, uh, life begins at conception, at implantation, and if you look in embryology textbooks, it starts at fertilisation. The embryologists are the experts. Now, in public debates, it's always a challenge for us to get to the truth of the matter, especially if we're dependent on the media for our information. It's a challenge for our churches to find knowledgeable Christians who can help us understand these issues to the point where we can make informed choices about these technologies when we're looking at them for ourselves. I think centres like CBHD are an invaluable resource to help Christians think through the ways to engage with this science in a way that will be pleasing to God. But how do Christians work through these types of, of problems? Well, Christians have a moral compass, and that's the Bible. We can learn a lot about how God wants us to treat unborn humans by looking at the way we have been made. The creation story in Genesis shows us that all human beings are made in the image of God and this is the basis on which we are to be treated equally and with dignity. In Genesis 1 it says God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Human beings have been uniquely made in the image and likeness of God. This sets us apart from other creatures which were made according to their kinds. In contrast to the modern philosophical view that personhood must be earned, the Bible teaches that our personhood is inherent because of the nature of the God whose image we reflect. We are to treat all human beings with respect for the whole of their lives, regardless of their particular characteristics. It is not our respect that gives them dignity. Rather, it is because they have innate dignity that we should treat them with respect. But when does it begin, the life of a human being? There is no key verse in the Bible which tells us exactly when life begins. The Bible isn't a scientific textbook. But human life certainly begins before birth. The Bible makes the link between conception and birth in many places, such in Genesis 4. Adam lay with his wife Eve and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. In Isaiah 46, God speaks to Israel as you whom I have upheld since you were conceived and have carried since your birth. Jesus' presence on earth began when he was um, an embryo, when the Virgin conceived through the Holy Spirit. In fact, the incarnation is a powerful reminder of the status embryos hold in the eyes of God. In order for him to take on full humanity, Christ had to commence his life as an embryo, not as a fully formed human. The Bible describes the relationship we have with God while we are still in the womb, such as during our formation. In Psalm 139, we have that wonderful passage, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And Job 10 has a similar description. These are only a sample of the verses uh, which illustrate these points. I've discussed many more in my book. But there is no doubt that the unborn human is recognised in the Bible as one who can have a relationship with God. The value of a human being can't be determined by a scientific formula. It can't be decided by a democratic vote. The value of a human being is based on our own understanding of morality as given to us by the God who made us, we were once embryos too. So let's keep this in mind as we look at how human embryos are manipulated with the current technology. 
Human embryos were first uh, created and grown in the laboratory as part of the research project which led to the development of IVF. The de those who developed IVF Um, Steptoe and Edwards uh, succeeded with their 102nd attempt at uh, creating a human embryo outside of the womb with um, the establishment of the pregnancy which led to the birth of Louise Brown in 1978. So she's now in her 30s and has actually had children naturally by herself. Since then, more than five million children have been born through IVF around the world. IVF was originally intended as a medical treatment for infertile couples, and it was a wonderful development for those suffering from the intense pain of infertility. But as time has gone on, we've seen more and more therapies added to the repertoire. We don't have time to describe them in detail, but to name the most common procedures, we have IVF, where sperm are collected from the man and eggs are, are collected from the woman. They're put together in a petri dish and uh, embryos are formed, which are then transferred to the uterus of the woman. We have intrauterine insemination, uh, and that's where sperm is injected straight into the uterus for those couples whose sperm need a little ex extra bit of help. If you uh, have a shortage of eggs or sperm, uh, you can have them donated. In fact, they're available even if you don't have a partner, uh, a condition which is called social infertility. ICSI, uh, intracytoplasmic sperm injection, is a more recent development if your sperm needed a little bit of extra help. So that, uh, one of the sperm is, is taken from the sperm sample and injected directly into the middle of the egg. Uh, that's if the sperm isn't strong enough to get there by themselves. If your eggs are old and you still want to use them, you have a cytoplasmic transfer where you can put part of a younger woman's egg uh, material inside your own. Of course, this means your child will have three uh, genetic parents, but at least you'll be one of them. Then there's GIFT and ZIFT and surrogacy. I actually could count 30 different ways that you could make a baby with the current technology. And now new directions in IVF aim to control the characteristics of the embryo implanted through analysis of the embryo's genetic makeup. Now, I don't know how much you know about genetics, but basically we all have 46 chromosomes in each of ourselves, half from our mother and half from our father, and that decides what we look like and how our bodies function. And we are currently in the midst of a genetic revolution. We've progressed quickly since 1953 when Crick and Watson uh, discovered the structure of DNA. The Human Genome Project, where the mapping of the entire human genome was, was achieved through an international project, um, that was completed in 2003 and you may be aware that that created a huge amount of data which is now leading to uh, lots of breakthrough in information about genetics. And it's enabled identification of the genes which are responsible for a whole host of illnesses. The problem is we can identify more illnesses than we can cure. And the solution to curing the problems that we can identify when we have no other solution is to simply discard those embryos or abort those, those babies uh, where an, an abnormality has been discovered. And so begins the age of new eugenics. Forget the breeding programs we've had in the past. New, that's hard to say, new eugenics, yes in a materialist world means, why should we tolerate our genetic problems? If we can do something about it, why, why don't we uh, get rid of these problematic genes altogether and clean up the human gene pool? And uh, that's in fact what's happening. In uh, ART, assisted reproductive technologies, uh, it, this is done by taking one or two cells from an eight-celled embryo and looking at them under the microscope. Uh, to see 
what their genetic makeup is. This was initially used just for serious life-threatening uh, childhood diseases. But now, as you can see, this is a list of illnesses that were screened for uh, from one of the IVF clinics in Sydney in 2009. They no longer publish the list of what they test for, but you can see this is a very long list already. It includes things uh, which are non-life-threatening, uh, where people can still have a normal lifespan. There are some things being tested for which won't necessarily guarantee you get an illness, just that you have a risk of an illness. It also has uh, some diseases which will only occur in adulthood. For example, adult onset cancers like breast cancer. Now, I'm sure that most people in the audience will know someone who developed cancer as an adult. Did that make you think the rest of their life was a mistake and they should never have been born? That's what we're saying when we, we're discarding these embryos because they have a gene for adult onset cancer. Apart from detecting serious illnesses, we are now also using uh, this genetic screening for sex selection for family balancing purposes, so you can have pink and blue teddy bears. Uh, we have what is being popularly called the saviour sibling, where uh, the gen genetic screening is looking at tissue types. And the idea is that you will um, create an embryo with a tissue type that matches a live sibling who has a serious illness with the idea that the embryo will come to birth to donate tissues or organs for their sick sibling. Um, this means we're using that child as a means to an end. And um, one thing that we don't hear about is how many embryos are discarded in this process. Of course, the way the media frames these arguments aren't the way I'm talking about them tonight. I lived in the UK when the first baby was born who was um, free of the gene of breast cancer. And the message was, isn't it wonderful that this child could be born and she won't have to live with the fear of breast cancer that every other woman in our family has. And of course, that sounds great. And nobody mentioned the 28 embryos which were discarded in the process of, of finding that one embryo. Once again, it's the idea that uh, human embryos uh, at this stage of development um, are, aren't sufficiently important to be protected. And uh, we also have some discussion of what have been called designer babies. And this is a search for better children in the sense of them being more wanted. Um, um, this is still science fiction, we can't do this, but if you've seen the movie Gattaca, you could see that parents could select, yes, I want to have a child with blue eyes, um, make sure at least they're at, s at six foot so they can play basketball and I want an A plus average. Um, but it's not possible, but there's certainly a lot of interest from parents who feel that any advantage they can give their child to get ahead in life is going to be a good thing. And as I said, it's not a reality yet, but what we have had happen is situations such as deaf parents who have wanted their children to experience the richness of the deaf culture and made sure they had a deaf child. Now, I don't know about you, but I would have thought that deafness is a handicap in our society. So if we are going to let parents make these sorts of decisions, you have to start to think, well, Who's going to decide what a disability is? is? Do we want to give parents this type of freedom? But anyway, despite all of these different technologies developing, success rates in IVF have always been low. Uh, it's generally less than 20% worldwide. Uh, it depends on many factors. But and in attempts to improve the success rates for their patients, several practices have developed. Clinics generally encourage couples to allow them to create as many embryos as possible after egg collection from the woman's body. Egg collection is an invasive and potentially life-threatening procedure, so you don't want to do it more often than you have to. But obviously, the more times you transfer an embryo into a woman's womb, 
the greater the chance that she'll become pregnant. So the idea is there's no formula to pr accurately predict how many embryos are needed for one live birth. So generally, the, uh, the clinics will suggest, let's just make as many embryos as possible. The more, the better, just in case we need them. And of course, at the outset, um, it's, uh, it's not expected that all those embryos will come to a live birth. And also, the, the couples who are presenting for treatment at IVF clinics are incredibly vulnerable emotion-wise. Emotion and if somebody says, this is going to increase your chances of getting a child, of course they're going to agree. They're very vulnerable at that stage. And so we have this situation where couples, even Christian couples, are allowing possibly more than 20 embryos to be made even though they would never consider wanting 20 live children. But the ex expectation is they won't all come to a live birth. Any embryos um, left over from the first treatment will be frozen and then transferred in future use. Some embryos won't survive defrosting and some won't develop once in the woman's womb. That's what's expected. But when the couple have as many children as they want, or perhaps they may have stopped treatment for another reason. For example, divorce is very common uh, because these treatments are so stressful and often parents will walk away um, from their embryos in this situation. P uh, the couples may find that suddenly they have surplus embryos, something they didn't think about in advance and they never expected. And it can it represent an unforeseen ethical problem for those parents. The number of excess human embryos in IVF labs increases yet again. And it's thought that there are in the, probably in the ballpark of around 400,000 frozen embryos in the USA at the moment. Another ethical problem uh, in the industry that's becoming a big issue in this country is the coercion of young women to donate their eggs to fertility clinics for those couples who don't have their own healthy eggs. And um, this is big money for, uh, for, just think, for a college student to be told they can get $10,000 for one cycle of eggs. Of course they're going to be tempted. But what they don't always think about is uh, the risks that they are putting themselves um, under or when they go through this treatment. Um, there's also the problem that we don't know the long-term effects of some of the hormone injections that are required for this treatment. And there's anecdotal stories of um, girls having life-threatening problems as a result of um, hyperstimulation, risks of cancer, and also that uh, the clinic follow-up is not always as good as it could be after these procedures. These are some of the ads I got off the net. I was particularly concerned about the one where um, the girl, uh, if you look at the, just the wording in these, um, make your dreams come true, answer her prayers. Her, her prayers were to get a child of her own and uh, make your dreams come true. She appears to have just gone shopping. So uh, I'm not very happy <laughs> with uh, how mercenary uh, we're taken to be, but I'm very troubled by the potential coercion of, of this industry. But these young women are being asked, um, won't they perform an act of compassion for a desperate couple? You can see how, how Christians who've been brought up thinking Christians are always compassionate may be tempted to do this type of thing. But are we preparing our young women for this type of, of an issue? Uh, this is a very complex area. We can talk more about ethical challenges in the question time. But suffice to say that with over 400,000 children a year being born with this technology, chances are that it's going to come up in a congregation near you. And this is an issue that our churches really have to start to think about because we do need to make some kind of an effort to get the education we need to understand enough about these issues to be able to guide our own decision making and to guide the decisions of those 
who we are counselling. So what are we to do with this situation? Well, we need to be thankful for the improved monitoring of pregnancy, which has improved the health of both mothers and babies. But the whole pregnancy industry now in the Western world is geared towards making sure that only perfectly normal babies come to birth. Tests are performed routinely in every pregnancy, which are aimed not just at working out whether we're going to have a healthy mother and baby, but also to find out whether these children have any genetic or other abnormality with the understanding that all abnormal children, all abnormal results will lead to an abortion. Now women often don't know why these tests are being done and um, some of them um, don't realise in fact what the tests are for until they're told that there's an abnormality and that it's recommended they have an abortion. Some women have an abortion under these circumstances because they feel ha they have no choice, even when they're morally opposed to abortion themselves. And this is a very troubling uh, situation that we're now in. And I think that all women need to learn something more about these tests before they, they even start trying to get pregnant. Now, it's easy to be judgmental about people who have abortions for these reasons. But we... And if we are going to, to say we, we don't want people to abort for disability or discard their embryos, I think the Christian community also has to realise what is involved when parents commit to a lifetime of caring for a disabled child. If people are going to have a disabled child, we have to do what we can to support them and lobby for improved services for disabled children in the community. Carrying, caring for a child for a lifetime with a serious disability which can't be cured is not to be taken lightly and we have to do all we can to support the people who make that choice. We also have to remember that those who carry a child who is known uh, to be unable to survive after birth is also an incredibly painful experience and we need to do what we can to support these very brave couples. However, it is still uh, abortion and discarding embryos for disability is the fastest growing group. It's also the group that does least well after an abortion because they are aborting what was previously a much wanted child and uh, many of them come to regret it uh, very much after the case. And not, a lot of these conditions are not even very serious conditions. Uh, there are conditions such as club foot, which can be corrected without even surgery, which is being given a reason for abortion. And so when those parents see a child with that abnormality after they've aborted their own child, uh, it can be an extremely painful um, uh, experience and uh, bring a lot of regret. But to finish off, at the heart of the debate is what is the moral status of the human embryo? What can we do about this? Well, I think it's pretty clear from what we've discussed tonight um, that really we have very good grounds for saying that legal protection is owed to the human embryo from the time of fertilisation. But we need to educate our congregations to be aware of this because they're probably not going to hear about it in the news. We also have to make sure our legislators know about it when they're considering beginning of life legislation. And we need to speak up ourselves whenever we get the chance in debate. But failing uh, these arguments prevailing in the public square, how do we find consensus at a community? Well, I would suggest it's just not possible. In the end, the moral status of the embryo is not a fact, but a value. And we each decide uh, what is valuable to us on the basis of our world view. Christians need to th learn how to think through their knowledge of scripture within a Christian worldview to start understanding how they should approach modern technologies. And there's not going to be 
uh, any time in the future where we're going to be able to reach a consensus in our community. And this is because the two groups, the pro-life and the pro-choice groups, are talking about different things. Those people who would pursue destruction of embryos are thinking about the consequences of, of their acts. Those who want to protect embryos and fetus are thinking about the act itself. There are some things you should never do regardless of the consequences. And our direction not to kill innocent people, it's one of the Ten Commandments, do not kill. So these two groups are passing like ships in the night. They will never meet, they have no common ground. And when there is no consensus, we, we just take a vote and he with the most votes wins. We need to keep on trying to win this vote. But when we do, we also have to remember that we're dealing with very difficult issues that are real uh, for many of the people that we know. And when we talk about these things in the public square, we have to realise that we're touching on very painful issues and we have to be very careful of the way where we frame our arguments. But our message is essentially a positive one. We want to keep saying yes to every human life and care for this being who is fearfully and wonderfully made. Thank you.